Thank you, Simon. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the really nice uh, acknowledgement of country as well. Really appreciate it. Welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to be presenting this today. Just before we do get started, I just want to warn um, this presentation uh, for, for, for people who are watching right now and future audiences that this presentation references suicide, death and sexual assault. If you feel that this content might be inappropriate for you or another audience member at this time, then please, I think, cease watching it. It's being recorded. It'll be shared and you can uh, return to it uh, when you feel appropriate. So this is a monumental year for the internet. Forget all the daily news stories about uh, threats to a free internet and the ever scrutinized ethics of big tech. This year, the internet actually turned 30 years old. That's a milestone birthday. Uh, in particular at 30, when you start to look back on the previous decade, like I'm, I'm, I'm in my forties now, you look back with a sense of growth and maturity and consumer internet certainly done all of the things that those teenagers uh, have done and more. And when it did turn 30 this year, it was a time that I myself think many reflected on more deeply on the influence it's had on our lives and what influence it could possibly have in the future. <coughs> um, it all started on, <coughs> excuse me, it all started on the 6th of August, 1991, with this message board posting from Tim Berners-Lee, who Simon mentioned earlier on in the introduction, um, which featured a short summary of a project that would become <clears throat> the very basis of the, of the page that I'm, we're all viewing right now. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, it wasn't much to look at back then, just text and links and academics sharing their passion. Uh, basic and simple in its design, but it was alive uh, nevertheless. And looking back to those early interactions, I think it's really easy to dismiss the simplicity and the naivety of the technology and those who were using it. Yet I, like others, are really interested in those early days of the internet at the moment, that first decade where people from all corners of the world were rushing in, creating new businesses, new cultures, new rules that we now take for gospel as the way the internet is and should be. And this is really important. Because in the middle of all this were the debates that media and civil society were having around all the issues, complications and unknown side effects of a free uh, international meeting place that anyone could inhabit, regardless of their politics, uh, religious beliefs or age. One of the debates that took place early on, particularly in the United States, and just a lot of, a lot of the content of this uh, presentation is going to be centred around uh, the what happened in the United States, well, because most of the large technology companies uh, I'll be referencing have come from there. And we obviously have our own legislation in Australia for those who are watching uh, and, and different, and, and also in Europe. But I'll, I, I'm, I'm focusing specifically on America here. Um, but a lot of the debates that were happening was really centered around how all types of objectionable content on the web, including hate speech and defamation, but initially porn should happen. And porn on the internet back then mainly consisted of ma magazine clippings and photos that were scanned and uploaded onto individual sites. It was a new phenomenon and a, a far cry from the, the live streaming platforms and aggregators that are completely prevalent today on the internet. Parents, educators, and basically anyone who had accessed pornography on the internet were concerned by the potential reach, which to the, that day had been restricted through um, media communi communications regulation. So it was a very, very different la landscape. The late US Senator James Exxon, a socially conservative Democrat from Nebraska, was one such figure in those early debates about the internet, um, uh, who would later be seen as the author of many of the issues we see today with the internet that we experience. Mr. President, I would like to say once again, I have here and have had the opportunity to share with several members of the Senate on both sides of the aisle what I refer to as the blue book. When I have shown this to members on both sides of the aisle, there has been shock registered obviously on the face of my colleagues. Shock because few understand what is going on today with regard to the pollution of the internet. I cannot would not show these pictures uh, to the Senate, would not want our uh, cameras to pick them up, but I think they probably are best described by 
some other material that has come to my attention by people who are strongly supporting our proposition. And it said, warning, do not open until further instruction, offensive material and clothes keep out of the reach of children. I would hope that all of my colleagues would, if they're interested, come by my desk and take a look at this disgusting material. Pictures of which were copied off the free internet only last week. To give you an idea of the depravity of our children, possibly our society being practiced uh, on the internet today. This is what the code section amendment is trying to correct. Um, basically, uh, what J James Axon sort of later went to say is my, my major concern is to make the new internet and information superhighway as safe as possible for kids to travel. The potential danger here is that the material that most rational and reasonable people would interpret as pornography and smut is falling into the hands of minors. The information superhighway is, in my opinion, a revolution that in years to come will transcend papers, radio and television as a source of, as an information source. Therefore, I think this is time to put some restrictions or guidelines on it. In reflection, what many of us would have give, given to have the simplicity of the problems uh, that, 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 wrapped up in, that were wrapped up in this uh, scenario back then. Big tech has come to fill every corner of the internet we inhabit. All of its ambition and confidence and grand ideas of equality and removing borders now are really clearly amounting to nothing more than the hype and hubris one enters when they're entering to a casino. And much has been written about the threats that big tech poses to our privacy. I, I don't believe that my contribution can add more to the level of debate that's been taking place. But earlier this year, I wrote about the way players like Facebook and Google are using their power to reshape the political landscape and write their own rules and histories. However, one of the more invisible stories uh, is the eroding effect that technology companies are having on access to justice, not just for minorities and those who are in the underprivileged, um, but for all of us everywhere. Just like the conversation about privacy, the impact is innocuous until you find yourself in the type of situation that thousands of people are finding themselves in today. And unfortunately, the effects can be lethal. Don't think you're an investor. We make investments morning, noon, and wait, what time is it exactly? Do we make short-term investments? long-term investments, we diversify our interests, realize our gains and losses, and try to keep the big picture in mind. You don't need to become an investor. You were born one. Robin Hood. Uh, that's the, the, that was a Super Bowl ad that played uh, for Robin Hood earlier this year uh, during the Super Bowl. In June last year, 20-year-old Alex Kearns took his own life as a result of his experience with the trading app in Silicon Valley darling, Robin Hood. Alex was at college after just finishing high school and had returned home as a result of COVID to live with his family through the pandemic. He had some savings around $5,000 and saw Robin Hood as a way of experimenting with the stock market in what his parents later described as a low risk environment. It's not surprising that both Alex and his family felt this way about Robin Hood. The app is free to sign up, uh, and, and unlike many other online brokerages at the time, such as E-Trade, it offers no charges to buy or to sell shares. It's listed on the NASDAQ, um, uh, and what happened in June, uh, this June that just passed, and was one of the most anticipated IPOs of the year. The, the, uh, the UI, the user interface, is extremely well designed, uh, making it really easy to navigate um, prospective companies and to trade in through, uh, you know, through tagging and to quicker and to quite quickly like really get in and out of uh, positions with a couple of swipes if you want to. Not only that, Robinhood does an excellent job of making the in-app experience exciting to inhabit. You only have to spend a few minutes browsing the Wall Street Bets Reddit group to understand how this experience can, connects and feeds into the modern trading ecosystem for young people that has emerged over the past five years. What Alex's parents didn't understand was how this ease of use and play had led Alex to signing up to be approved to buy and sell options. Options trading is a much more sophisticated type of trade that requires a level of sophistication and understanding that goes well beyond the normal buy for a dollar or sell for a two approach. 
and it amounts to traders making a series of bets on stock through leveraging, which can end up with significant returns, which many people have experienced, but also significant losses. On the 11th of, of, uh, of July, Alex signed into Robinhood to find that his account was restricted, restricted due to a negative cash balance of $730,000. Later that night, the company sent an automated email demanding Alex take immediate action, requesting a payment of more than $170,000 in just a few days. You can see here, uh, the $16,000, which is the sum of his initial cash investment. So he's making some money, taking that $5,000 and then progressed it uh, to that day. But you can see here the negative $730,000 in investment that appeared in Alex's account. And you only have to put yourself into Alex's shoes just for a split second here to understand the terror that he must have been experiencing from viewing the UI of his Robinhood app at that moment. Being only 20 years old and thinking that he was risking $5,000 of his savings is a long, long way to losing twice the median house of a ha cost of a house in the United States in 2020. In his mind, his immediate or even long-term future had been destroyed in the time it takes for facial recognition to log you into, you, into your iPhone. What I'd really like to unpick and then highlight um, is what happens next in this story because my point with this case study is not about how careless user interface design can kill people or the big tech should stop uh, improving user experience because we, we want that. We want that experience to expand it. The risk that is quietly emerging day by day is that if technology companies can't address these complaints and challenges and issues that we have with using their products in a transparent, consistent, timely and fair manner, then we'll find that our basic right to access to justice will exist and apply to our activities in the real world, but not in our internet lives. Robinhood has no contact number, just an email ticketing system, probably Zendesk, where you submit your issue and wait for a response. Alex emailed Robinhood that day, not once, but three times, desperately seeking help with his urgent and very serious issue. He did not receive any response in any of those occasions, no phone call, nothing more than a canned response. And one that we've seen many, many times before. And I'm sure many of you could just jump into your, could copy and paste this, jump into your inbox now, do a search and find various uh, canned responses like this. He tried emailing again the following day, but was met with the same response, which would have left him in a state of, uh, of despair that's unmanageable to many people. And later that day, Alex took his own life. The day after, while Alex's family was trying to make sense of what had happened, and trying to piece all this together, the series of events, what, what, you know, why and how, Robin would send another automated message with no sign of human interference. This time uh, it was a different message. Great news, we're reaching to out to confirm that you've met your margin call and we've lifted your trade restrictions. If you have any questions about our, your margin call, please feel free to reach out, we're happy to help. I've been using Robinhood for the past seven years, and although my experience is comparable to its impact, it nonetheless highlights that this was just this wasn't just one off occurrence, but part of a cultural and administrative culture at, at, at Robinhood. In 2018, I received a, a, an erroneous six-figure penalty notice from the IRS. I was living in America at the time, uh, which was exasperated by the the government shut down that year, so they shut down the entire IRS. I needed financial statements from the previous year and attempted to download them from the Robinhood Tax Centre. But while I couldn't download some, I could download some, the remaining few I, I needed uh, would send me to a 404 page quoting J.R. Tolkien. I emailed support several times. I looked for a phone number to call. And to this day, I've not received anything more than the same CAM response that Alec Hearns received. My ticket, just like Alex's, would have sat in a queue with possibly tens of thousands of other people's uh, issues, which Robinhood's team or system would have deemed as customer experience collateral damage to platform growth. If you literally cannot speak to a human to escalate your issue, to differentiate, uh, to differentiate it from a tax concern to a mental health threat, then where do you go? Hi, I'm John Paul Bremer, AKA Ola Papi, and my eyes can't perceive the color orange. I don't know why it's a problem. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about how to date in this video. First of all, I have like sexually induced sneeze syndrome. Whenever you feel aroused, you uncontrollably feel like you have to sneeze. One time I was like in the middle of hooking up with someone and it was just like <laughs> reaching up from like my toes up to my body. And it just, I just sneezed all over him and then he went home.
The other thing about men that's really funny is like you just never know where they're gonna come from. You're on Grinder and you're ready and you're available. It's like there's no one, but when you're like alone in the Chili's parking lot at like 2 a.m., one will just like appear from behind a bush and make eye contact eye contact with you for like a really uncomfortable amount of time. And he'll be holding this like cooler thing. And you're gonna want to know what's in the box. But if you open the box, your life will never be the same. <laughs> Don't look at it. It's a promotional ad from um, from Grindr. I'll talk to him in a few a few minutes. What duty of care do emerging tech top, tech companies have to the use of their services, and should they be liable if they don't respond in a fashion that is consistent with how we have come to expect in the real world? In a, in a 2019 case before the Supreme Court in the United States, led by lawyer Carrie Goldberg, who's actually uh, made quite a bit of fame at the moment. Um, uh, and it says it extended her career. And her client, Matthew Herrick, um, uh, provided some really unfortunate guidance for platforms on the internet. In 2016, Matthew Herrick had recently separated from his then uh, boyfriend, Oscar Juan Carlos uh, Gutierrez, and found himself in a complicated and ultimate, really, ultimately really dangerous scenario. Matthew had ended his relationship with Gutierrez as a result of his increasingly jealous and clingy behavior, including showing up at his workplace. What happened next highlights the complications that can emerge from the architecture of technology companies who have a consumer facing user base. As uh, his lawyer outlines, Matthew had been sitting in front of his brownstone apartment in New York, smoking a cigarette, when a stranger called him from the sidewalk and started uh, to walk up to the steps towards him. The stranger's tone was friendly and familiar as if uh, they were acquaintances. However, Matthew had never met that individual in his life. Do I know you? He asked, to which the man replied, Dude, you were just texting me and he held up his phone for Matthew to see. On the phone was a profile from dating app Grindr, which featured a shirtless picture of Matthew himself standing in his kitchen, smiling. According to court filings, um, the, the onslaught of visitors was relentless. They would ring his buzzer at all hours, wait for him when he walked his dog, follow him into his bath the bathroom during his lunch, uh, his brunch shifts at work, accost him at his gym and locker room and lurk in the stairwell in his apartment building. Over the next 10 months, more than 1,400 men, as many as 23 in a day, arrived in person at Matthew's home and job. Some were innocuous and well-meaning and others were not. Um, and the sheer volume of interactions had a devastating effect on his life. His ex-partner had not only put up his profile on numerous other dating sites, but in a complete disregard for Matthew's safety, outlined to potential suitors that he was seeking fisting, orgies, and aggressive sex. They were told that if he resisted, that this was just part of role-playing fantasy and that he was into it and that they should just go along. It was clear that, that Gutierrez was using Grindr to recruit men from its platform to sexually assault Matthew. Um, in an interview with BuzzFeed uh, News in, 19, in 2019, Herrick described his experience as a horror film. Horror, horror film. Uh, in addition to Herrick's personal data and information were also uh, shared uh, alongside with false claims that he was HIV positive. What remains unknown and frightening according to the court filings was that even though Matthew had closed his account uh, and had deleted the app in 2015, Grinder was still able to leak his geolocation data. This account is without dispute harrowing on a personal and human level, and anyone would not want to see this to happen to their family member, friend, or even you know, an enemy. But let's zoom into the interactions between the, the, the user of the platform and the platform itself. Any person in this situation would look at two immediate actions, contacting the police and contacting the platform, which Matthew did both. Harrick made 14 police reports and obtained a family court order of protection against his stalker. It would take months before Herrick's stalker was arrested. Herrick and his friends filed roughly 50 reports with Grinder asking for help. Grinder was the only one that could help and, and, and was on repeated notice and was uniquely and exclusively qualified to do so. The only response Herrick received for his pleas for help from Grinder were auto replies, similar to what we saw in the case of Matthew Kearns. And in the end, uh, Herrick took his complaint to court where it ended up in the south, uh, Southern District uh, of New York. At the hearing, Grinders counsel argued that the company was not obligated to act, nor were they liable for the harm experienced at the hands of the surface. And in fact, they were right. Uh, reading through the order and opinion of District Judge Valerie Caproni, you can see many of the um, different attempts made by Herrick's legal counsel to connect the actions of Grinder 
both as a platform and service to Herrick's experience. All of these were ultimately made uh, dead ends by federal legislation. This is a picture of Bill Clinton and a very, very young Al Gore. Bill Clinton doesn't seem to age very much, I feel. Uh, they're signing into law the Communications Decency Act, which passed in 1996. Uh, it's Champion, who I showed earlier, Senator Exxon, who um, pushed for this law on the basis of protecting citizens from harm on the internet, unwittingly gave Grindr the legal right and shield against its actions and lack of action in Garrick's case. This shield um, meant that Grindr and other platforms like it can't be made accountable legally or financially for the content that's uploaded by its users and the behaviour of users themselves. There is no, there's absolutely no way around it. Carrie Goldberg petitioned the Supreme Court of the United States to review the case and shine more light on how we should interpret a law written in the dial-up era of technology with the, within the prism of the modern tech behemoths, but expectedly the judges turned it down. As the court documents in Herrick versus Grindr state, while dating applications with Grindr's functionality appear to represent relatively new technological territory for the, um, uh, for the CDA, past cases suggest strongly that the plaintiff's attempt to artfully plead his case in order to separate the defendant from the protections uh, of the act is a losing proposition. The fact uh, that the technology company contributed to the production or represent presentation of content is not enough to defeat the immunity. Rather, a tech company only loses its immunity if it assists in the development of what makes the content unlawful. Now, there are two clear dimensions of exploring the scenario that we can take. One is the legal lens, where we look at the responsibilities of a platform in relationship to the law. The other is that are safe for people that use them and the wider community. Exploring the legal dimension means that we need to understand why such a law operates in this particular way, especially when it was established to protect people from harmful content, not corporations. The day that uh, the, the Communications Decency Act passed in 1996, Senator Exxon started his speech with the following prayer. Um, Almighty God, Lord of all life, we praise you for the advancements in computerized communications that we enjoy in our time. Sadly, however, there are those who are littering this information superhighway with obscene, indecent, and destructive pornography. Lord, we are profoundly concerned about the impact of this on our children. Oh God, help us care for our children. Give us wisdom to create regulations that will protect the innocents. Back then on this day, only half the senators present had an email address and less than 25% of members of the United States House had email addresses themselves, which is a testament to how new all of this was for America. The act passed, however, a series of events similar in nature to what is taking place today meant that the original version of the act was short-lived. A year earlier, America had experienced one of its worst homeland terrorist, homeland terrorist attacks to date. The Timothy McVeigh created a two and a half thousand kilo bomb made of ammonium nitrate and nitromethane and detonated it on the Alfred P. Murrow building, uh, a government building, just as offices opened for the day at 9 a.m. The blast killed 168 people, including 19 children in the daycare center on the second floor and injured over 600 uh, others. Six days later, a series of anonymous posts appeared on an AOL message, AOL message board, so uh, America Online, which was the prevalent provider back then, advertising T-shirts with crude slogans such as McVeigh for president or, and visited, visit Oklahoma, it's a blast. Whilst it was anonymously listed, the post cited the name and phone number of Kenneth Zeran, a man who had no connection to the post or to the AOL platform. The post encouraged people to get in touch and that Ken would donate a dollar for every T-shirt sold to the victim's families. Within a number of days, Ken had started to receive abusive and threatening phone calls, which began to rapidly increase as local, a local a conservative radio personality read the AOL messages on his show. Zarin was unable to use his telephone um, as threatening calls were coming in every two to three minutes. And eventually his home was placed under police protection. This is all the way back in like 95. Eventually, eventually AOL took the post down after pleading by Zarin, but he filed, Zarin filed suits against AOL alleging that as a distributor, AOL was negligent in failing to adequately respond to the notices on its bulletin board after being made aware of them. In the same period, other internet service providers were under attack in the courts for hosting content uploaded by their users, most, like, most notably Stratton Oakmont, Inc. versus Prodigy Services Co. at the New York Supreme Court. 
which held that online service providers could be held liable for the speech of their users. AOL was a big player and a big tech player, we, we might say back then, uh, with big influence and uh, internet service providers were scared. This, this series of events, among many others that were taking place in these days of, the, of, of internet regulation, meant the Communications Decency Act was amended to include Section 230 as a way of ensuring that publishers could be protected. Uh, and the specifically called clause called Section 230 outlines, no provider or user of an inter interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. If you were to zoom out and look at the mechanisms of the Communications Decency Act, you'll see that we have two very complementary forces of work. Now, some people argue that, that they're contradictory. Uh, they couldn't both exist and allow the clarity for corporations to function within the law. However, from the vantage point of, of, of 25 years since then, of hate speech, revenge porn, uh, mass trolling, and also you know, the, the years of Trump and how he's used platforms, um, however cr crude, they could have worked in tandem. The first mechanism forces the platform to moderate and regulate this content for the protections of users of the internet from harmful content. It provides a legal basis for people who experience issues and problems online to interact with technology companies and legitimately demand outcomes that satisfy their salute situations, to get content down and to do it in a timely fashion. And then the second mechanism provides space for technology platforms to operate in, in the first place, which is, which is really important. Um, and we see the difference between technology uh, platforms in the, the US and, uh, and in Europe on the basis of this, of this protection. Uh, it, it protects them from claims that are outside of, their, outside of their control. One would have expected that if the law operated in the way that it was intended, then platforms would have explored, innovated and created solutions to satisfactorily mediate and balance this risk, protecting their interests, the interests of their users, and also profit, those are the shareholders, but it didn't work out that way. This is Chris Cox. He's the main proponent and architect of uh, Section 230. Shortly after the Act passed, so we had the whole um, Communications Decency Act passed in with, with everything bundled in, um, the first component that Exxon put forward was struck down by the Supreme Court on the basis of free speech. That's right. That was, it was completely removed. However, Section 230 of the Act was allowed to remain entirely intact. The original intent of the Communication Decency Act had moralistic motivations and undertones, but it served as a means for all of us to explore the architecture of the internet from a more proactive and responsible basis. This permanent and everlasting change would mean not just the removal of legal responsibilities of internet service providers and technology platforms to moderate their content, but the very concept that this was something that startups and new companies should even contemplate. The tech crash of the dot-com era wiped out the majority of players that were part of this landscape. But with it, it wiped out the collective memory of conversations of this era, of the debates and the negotiations in a way that meant by the time Web 2.0 and the sharing economy came around 10 years later, the prevailing motto and dialect of young entrepreneurs was build it, grow it, and figure the rest out later. Yeah, I think one time I told somebody about our product. In fact, I, I, there's this person who works for an uh, executive at Disney. I'm like, yeah, we have a product team. And he thought, a product? He said, product, do you mean like the house? And at Airbnb, we, we historically called the product like the website and the applications, the technology. I'm like, oh, weird. See, at Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg calls the product the website or the app. But it, I, at, technically speaking, the product is whatever the customer is buying. The customers are not buying our website and they're not buying our application. That's just a storefront and communication. But what they're buying is a house. And frankly, what they're buying more than a house is the host experience of hospitality, this idea of belonging. And so we realized very early on that we are um, an online to offline business. In fact, in China, they call it O to O, online to offline. But we kind of started, I don't know if you could see, I think the sharing economy, we're kind of like a next wave of the internet. So the, there was a wave of the internet, things online, Amazon, books online. There was another wave of the internet thing connecting together, LinkedIn, Facebook. But then there's another wave of the internet, the internet going back into the real world. And Airbnb was one of those examples. And so we started storyboarding the experience and realizing it's really about every moment of the experience. And we have to be responsible, not just for the online part of the product, but the offline part of the product. And so that's... 
Um, as I described, Web, Web 2.0 brought on a new breed of, of companies who'd never had to think about moderation um, in a deeply meaningful and structurally integral way. Uh, it's not taught about in design school. It falls outside the deep technical, uh, uh, deep technical design. It exists as a, a problem to be solved by some other part of the design ecosystem. The Digital Millennium Act had dealt with issues of copyright, meaning that if you put up material that you didn't hold the rights to, you could get away with it until you were asked by the license holder to take it down. And in YouTube actually uh, creates an excellent tech around how to, how to manage this. But this meant there were relatively no limits to what you could do with a code repository, a server, and an interested global audience. For this essay, I steered clear of Facebook because I'm, I'm, I'm not because I'm a closet fan, but I, just because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in demonstrating the way in which any company that is born of this culture is psychologically constituted when it comes to thinking about moderation, access to justice, and responsibilities of user safety. We've all heard from former um, Facebook product uh, manager Francis Horgan testifying in the past few weeks about uh, before the US Senate that the leadership of Facebook knows how to make its product safer, but has chosen not to due to an emphasis on astronomical product uh, profits instead of people. The issues at Facebook are political, cultural, and complex, so much so that we could probably spend hours stuck in the universe alone pondering the mind and ethics of Mark Zuckerberg. So instead, I'd like to just follow the story of a new breed of company born in the sharing economy epoch of the internet. Airbnb was born when Brian Chetsky and Joe Gabia, graduates from the first of the same design school, created the initial concept for an air bed and, and breakfast during uh, an industrial design conference held in San Francisco. So held in San Francisco. The premise back then was pretty simple. Rent out your room uh, to people on the internet for money. The idea was hardly uh, original. Couch surfing emerged as a platform in, uh, in 1999 for travelers to share a couch with people they didn't know on the internet. And if, I'm sure there's probably a few people watching that, that, that were part of that experience and, and, and being part of that. And that was, that was an interesting subculture all its own. Everyone's been on a family vacation where the, the brochure turns out to faintly resemble the real experience. I was in the South of France once on a family vacation um, for one, for my own experience, but packing our bags for a flight the following morning to Paris. At 8 p.m., we received a message from the host saying they had to cancel the booking due to an unspecified plumbing issue. And within less than 12 hours from our stay and two kids under three years old, the prospect of finding a suitable alternative in September in Paris was absolutely daunting. So I tried to get in touch with the MB, the, uh, the, the dispute resolution uh, team to help me. Their response was late. It was poorly coordinated and nowhere near adequate. I was, it felt like I was calling a foreign insurance company fully outsourced without the power to actually engage with the issues beyond just the platitudes. And that was in 2015. And I believe that my issue was, was trivial in the wider context of a global platform. Although at the time it felt really, really critical to me, it was routine, the type of issue that a platform like Airbnb must receive day in and day out. But little did I know back then, the dispute resolution team at Airbnb was still in its infancy and already they were dealing with issues that went way, way beyond the ordinary experience of a hotel. In the early days of the platform, the founders um, were the dispute resolution team at Airbnb. They answered their compl the complaints on their mobile phones. As the company scaled, it too had to make the transition um, from, from a startup with scant resources to a publicly listed entity servicing you know, millions of, uh, of reservations a year. However, it's really challenging to contemplate that Airbnb did not take the issue of complaints and harm to users seriously by investing the money and people required for seven years up until the date of my trip. And when they did start to introduce a more substantially designed team and, 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 and dispute operation, that's a long time in internet time, especially when you're a fast going startup. Through the years, uh, Brian Chetsky, who, who we saw earlier, at various, the Airbnb CEO, at various points of Airbnb's growth curve, has spoken about the company's dedication to safety and trust. It each time has appeared to be in response to some external crisis rather than part of an innate sense of responsibility or a system design at Airbnb. The first I recall, and I think many of you might recall, uh, encountering came from a host of Airbnb who returned home in 2011 to find that a guest had ransacked her entire apartment. She said, within an entire week living in my apartment, DJ and his friends had more than enough time to search through literally everything inside, to rifle through every document, every photo, every drawer, every storage container, every piece of clothing I own, 
essentially turning my world inside out and leaving a disgusting mess behind. This harrowing experience uh, played into the fears of, of almost anyone who had thought of putting their apartment up for rent on mine before. The fact that it was so clearly detailed and took place in San Francisco, the headquarters of the company and the birthplace, the epic could imagine themselves in similar scenarios. Yet this incident had three clearly defined acts. The first was the incident itself. The second was the experience with connecting with Airbnb. And the third I'll, I'll talk about in a second. But as the host went on to outline in her blog post, my first call was to 911. I stood by horrified and hysterical as two officers from a San, San Francisco Police Department checked every corner, every closet with guns wielded. My next call was to Airbnb. I tried their urgent line, their email addresses, their general customer support line. I heard nothing, no response whatsoever until the following day, 14 sleepless hours later, and after a desperate call to an Airbnb freelancer, I happened to know helped my case get some attention. And she followed by saying that this has been my, uh, my most urgent request of the agency is that they immediately institute a 24 hour day customer support line. Um, it's a 24 hour day business absolutely needs this in place. The third part of this story was the public response from Airbnb, in which famously became known as Ransack Gate. The host detailed that after she had written her account on her blog, Brian Chetsky had contacted her and rather than offering support, asked her to remove the story from her blog, saying it could hurt an upcoming round of funding. Soon Ransack Gate was trending on Twitter and the incident became an important moment in history for the company. Chetsky apologies and a ramped up of services for hosts, including social identity checks, and introducing a $50,000 host guarantee to pay for the damages experienced by a host in similar circumstances. However, the team was clearly playing catch up. The organization did not have the institutional knowledge, the protocols, the system design, all the people to be able to deal with issues of this nature. And it's interesting to know that this was a host side issue up until that date. No stories of, exp of guest experiences successfully made their way into the public sphere. But as Chetsky and the people at Airbnb outlined, the link between hosts and guests was a major driving force of growth for the business. If you're a guest, you're more likely to Airbnb your apartment out while you're being a guest somewhere else and vice versa. Four years later, a 29-year-old Australian woman was on a holiday in New York and out with friends in Manhattan. She returned back to the Airbnb she'd rented on West 37th Street and didn't notice anything odd or suspicious as she entered the apartment. However, as Olivia Carville, an investigative reporter for Bloomberg, very, very deep, um, excellent reporting recounts, the, the young woman was met by a man with a kitchen knife who proceeded to rape her. He left and took with, her, with him her mobile phone and other belongings. Uh, and she was able to call the police and they were able to apprehend the man. This time, when the woman contacted our Airbnb, her matter was dealt with by an internal crisis management team. Her mother was flown out from Australia to help her and Airbnb, uh, help her and Airbnb secretly paid her $7 million to keep the incident quiet, lest it spark media scrutiny, particularly at a time when Airbnb was in fact deemed illegal to operate in New York for this particular type of rental. Uh, there was other bits with it. This, this was an, an illegal rental. By 2016, the safety team at, um, uh, was overwhelmed with calls, many of them minor in nature, and Airbnb started training con uh, contractors in center, call centers around the world to handle the flood of complaints. Airbnb says that fewer than 0.1% of uh, stays result in a reported safety issue, but with more than 200 million bookings a year, that's still a lot of trips with bad endings. And only the most serious problems are transferred to the internal safety team. Today, the internal complaints team is, based in, is spread out across Dublin, Montreal and Singapore, but the majority of disputes are outsourced to third party teams around the world. Airbnb spent an average of $50 million annually on payouts to hosts and guests, including um, on legal sediments and damages to homes. This is how a modern listed internet company deals with complaints on its platform. You create a small unit within your company, then you outsource the bulk of the operations of this to other companies at a lower cost. Problems that are flagged by a predetermined set of rules are dealt with centrally, and those that are deemed to be at risk to the company's reputation are paid off. Non-disclosure agreements are signed and maybe people get their day in court, but only if the platform you happen to be on has chosen to take accountability for their role in the matter. You are entirely dependent on the founder's sense of what their responsibilities to their users are. And if this comes up against larger goals, such as an upcoming raise or an IPO, 
then the application of justice will be dedicated to by the intent of the founders and the culture that circles them that they've created. Or you're a company like Robinhood. You simply set up a ticketing system, automate relevant bulk responses, and hope that services like Zendesk and Atlassian can figure out ways to that reduce the number of support people required through automation and artificial, artificial intelligence. You program the service in a way that best meets your own definition of, of a service level agreement with your customers. But how do you set up those rules in the first place? And how do you ensure that the legitimate issues are dealt with by the right people in the right way? What motivates you to do that? You can't catch every ticket. There's, there's too many users. So you can try to do the right thing, but ultimately the legal team ends up with mediating disputes in the United States where most of these platforms originate or end. If you live outside of the borders of America or the West, where there is no corporate headquarters, where you can't tap into a friend in your network who happens to know someone who works at that technology company, then you must endure endless torment and personal destruction, all because you signed up to an account on the internet. If there's no law that is forcing tech companies and designers to design in protections and safeguards, should these companies even bother to deal with this problem? Currently, the answer is no, only when it makes sense. This is creating a knock-on effect where we are essentially replicating the same crappy justice experience um, uh, and system that we currently have in the real world. If you need to wait months on end or years to have your dispute taken seriously, then the system ends up looking like we have in the family court in Australia, where disputes are long, costly, and access to justice becomes a reward you receive as a result of endurance or privilege or a combination of both. This erosion, like all erosions, is slow, it's inconspicuous to the naked eye, and is a byproduct of both the legislative setting, but also a culture that exists across the entire tech and design ecosystem. From the startup founders to the venture, venture capital ecosystem, the Baxam to tech and design tribes that move from one company to the next company, selling their technical skills and systems uh, know-how to the same C-suite staff who manage the same type of problem at the previous um, uh, uh, tech company. It's not a diversity problem. It doesn't matter who you bring into the fold of your organisation. Culturally, it will be solved in the same way. The PACT Act would preserve companies' 230 protections for material posted on their sites, but it would require companies to remove material that has been adjudicated as illegal by a court. Large sites like Facebook and Twitter would be required to remove illegal content within 24 hours, while smaller sites would be given additional time. Failure to remove illegal material would result in the sites losing its 230 protections for that content or activity, a provision that matches a recent recommendation made by the Department of Justice for Section 230 reform. Finally, Madam President, in addition to promoting transparency and accountability, the PACT Act also contains measures to strengthen the government's ability to protect consumers. And as the Department of Justice has noted in its recommendations to reform Section 230, broad Section 230 immunity can pose challenges for federal agencies in civil enforcement matters. It is questionable whether Section 230 was intended to allow companies to invoke. That was uh, Republican Senator John Thune at, uh, in the United States Senate, who I'll get to shortly. So how do we address this, this harm without causing total and absolute chaos to the existing internet that we know? To, to start to think about how we change all this, to redirect course, we need to imagine the internet of the 90s as less of a wild west, but as a state where uh, that was unadulterated, simple in its design, with multiple options for, uh, for, for users of the internet to act upon. Paradigms have been created across design technology, customer service, dispute resolution, and our own relationships and interactions with the, with the products we use uh, that are endlessly reproduced, leaving us all with this sense that this is the way that technology is experienced and there are no alternative options. The various dimensions, the legislative, the cultural, and the, the user-centric must all start to be addressed for us to move away from this sense of nihilism when it comes to the, the use of, te of technology we use. In June this year, Senator Republican John Thune reintroduced a bill, a bipartisan bill called the Filter Bubble Transparency Act. The bill would require large scale internet platforms that collect data from more than 1 million users uh, and gross more than 50 million in, in annual revenue to provide greater transparency to consumers 
and allow users to view content that is not being curated as a result of, a, of an algorithm. So you can basically reset what the platform sets to, sends to. A second bill called the Platform Accountability and uh, Consumer Transparency, Transparency Act seeks to go one step further and actively strip Section 230 protections from companies that do not take active steps to moderate their content or respond to court requests to remove harmful content. These are starting points. They are the um, reimagining of human agency in a world where currently options are non-existent or buried deeply in the user settings none of us know exist. Now you might ask, well, what actual effect will this have on content moderation, trolling, revenge porn, and access to justice on the internet? And the reason why this type of thinking is important is it starts to reintroduce into the minds of people using the internet that they have options, that they can control the way in which these platforms operate, and they too have agency in a world governed by large platforms. This type of thinking also forces these companies not uh, to not just operate a single one-dimensional view of the people that use their software, but as individuals with agency. This type of regulation means that legislative restraints will need to come into the technical exploration and ultimate service design of products. It may be too late for the likes of Facebook. Um, you know, I'm not sure if many people have read, but you know, Facebook is launching, most likely launching a re total rebrand next week and it's dropping the name. Um, but it is a place to start um, for other companies and will no doubt be a discussion for the design community if these bills pass Congress, which, which isn't certain, of course. The second point to all this is that artificial intelligence should be able to solve these types of, of problems. They should be able to detect patterns of misgrimed behaviour. They should be able to detect when a user is using the same geolocation data as a complaint filed earlier that hour, week or month. They should be able to, able to recognise a difference in context between an 18 year old with $5,000 invested in options trading on the end of a $135,000 margin call and a 40 year old middle aged white guy trying to get some paperwork for a tax return. And that recognition should allow companies to think and act more comprehensively on issues of user harm and, uh, and harassment. This isn't the case at the moment because AI in these companies and the serious engineering power is being used to solve problems like more efficiently displaying content and, and, and aligning ad, ad, advertisements that align with user data or optimizing problems with the revenue funnel end of the funnel, not the human end of the funnel, where we each react differently, either as benevolent uh, participants or sometimes malicious actors. I'm not saying let's all sit back and wait for AI to come on through and make the internet a more just place. The technology needs its own measures and set of guiding ethics to ensure we don't harvest and amplify the same kind of prejudices and poor decision making that currently exists in the real world. And just because Airbnb possesses dispute resolution data handled in the first half of its life doesn't mean that it should use that data as a building block to train an algorithm to be used in the next decade. But the sheer magnitude of, uh, of users taking use taking place on these platforms combined with the complexity of human interaction with guests and hosts, couples trying to hook up with each other, traders seeking to understand the underlying mechanisms behind their trades, and a magnitude of other uses means that human intervention and outsourced, outsourced dispute centres can only go so far. The cultural side of this equation from an organisational perspective is perhaps the hardest element for us to predict and also to change. Laws certainly help, but it takes leadership and hard decisions to ensure that users of a platform have a legitimate and enduring means of connecting with the managers of a product when harm takes place. What I'd like to see from the next generation of startups who are pitching right now for the talent and the capital to grow into tech giants is a culture that actively pushes product development from the point of friction between the service and the people it serves. So the very, very end, the disputes area. When Airbnb pitched to venture capitalist Chris Saka in its early rounds, he famously said to Chetsky and Kabir, guys, this is super dangerous. Somebody's gonna get raped or murdered and the blood is gonna be on your hands. And he didn't invest. The culture that we inhabit needs to press these concerns and act with questions of access to justice front of mind, no matter how seemingly twee or benign the concept engineering and design talent, so that's right, people and who are actually making the code and designers should be auditing companies on the way in which, uh, on the way in to see if the effort that is spoken uh, actually lines up in the team structure and the deployment of capabilities. Are they doing the thing they're going to say? Is the money where they say it is? And investors should demand that companies they invest in 
to close the ratio of revenue to dispute resolution spend, uh, along with outlining in the annual report significant issues with, with, with users. My persistent view is consistent with what I wrote about in our redesigning work publication a few years back. We're currently experiencing the crude early forms of technology companies and platforms which are unsophisticated, brutish, and heavy handed in their management and execution. We don't know any better because so few of us have experienced an environment that truly balances design, economics, and human centered technology without leaving us the feeling that we should be grateful to have something that was better than a few decades ago or a few years. The internet evolves really quickly. One minute we're collectively chasing Pokemons around our front lawns, the next we can hail a car to pick us up from the doorstep and track its approach on our screen. Where we direct our energy today matters. The next decade needs us to push for an internet that keeps us safe and resolves our problems at the same time. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. I know we've got uh, four minutes to go, so I'll open up to the, uh, to the group if there's any questions. We've probably got time for a couple of questions before we finish up two. Thanks, Simon. I have one to get started. Oh no, we've got something in the Q&A in the chat. Fantastic, we will go through that. Okay. Uh, given the many different types of harms and risks uh, these companies present, how should and can the law respond in a manner that can protect consumers while at the same time not discouraging innovation? Yeah, that's. I think that's a really interesting point. I'm just going to stop sharing my share screen as well so folks can get a sense. Um, you know, there's, there's an argument that says if we didn't have uh, Section 230 originally, that you, you wouldn't get those um, those limits or the, that you wouldn't get the type of companies that we have today and we wouldn't advance in the way. And you, that people, a lot of people point to point to Europe and say, well, look, what's actually come out of Europe? And there's not much, uh, you know, there, there are a lot, sorry, there's a lot of great companies that come out of Europe, but it hasn't been the leader of, of tech. I think the point is that um, uh, we've come to this distance and this length and we've got a really, really great understanding. We should be unpicking and, uh, and, and not just having a broad blanket approach, but calling out some of those harms and providing specific um, uh, you know, mechanisms to advise people legally for how they should act. Now we know when government picks up um, some, uh, legislation and challenges, they can sometimes get it wrong. And yes, that does happen and it is, it, is, it is challenging, but we have to kind of be thinking about um, this as a really important car, core fundamental part of the internet. And I think the point is that we need to be, we need to acknowledge that we aren't dealing with in 1995 anymore. Um, we've got the, the amount of internet usage is increasingly growing. And if you think like the next decade, we're going to see the um, internet of things introduced into our homes, but there's a whole series of privacy issues that will unfold there too. So I think the idea of like making blanket approaches is, uh, should be in the past. We need to, we need to, you know, all, organize, all companies, organizations and our government should be looking at this um, and, act, and acting, companies should be acting on their own too and setting up their own internal policies around this. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I have a, a question if there is another one from the floor. Um, you raised throughout the presentation that this is an access to justice issue. I wondered if you could paint more of the connection you see between access to justice and how this actually involves individual people. Good question. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Well, I think that um, you know we deal with access to justice in our space a lot. We we talk, we, we 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 deal with like community legal aid centres and we deal with people with, um, you know who are typically um, really uh, incumbent from uh, from accessing justice due to their personal circumstances or where they um, or financial. And I guess what the connection I'm trying to tie uh, together here is that um, if we don't have the right kind of mechanisms with platforms that exist today, um, then this will not, the knock on knock effect will be to just general users of, uh, of services. If you can't walk up to the, the, um, to the government organisation uh, or the federal building and, and start uh, making a claim or a case, um, and, you can, uh, and the court that is dealing with your matter doesn't, is in a completely different jurisdiction, then what, what, what hope do we have um, around resolving these things? So, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a really clear uh, connection there, um, or, or my belief is, and um, yeah, happy to take that up further, so. Thanks, Andrew. Um, look, I think there's uh, an additional, uh, no, we've got another question, but I think we're at time. So what we might do is look to answer that as synchronously. Uh, there'll be a recording of this uh, podcast that we give. Uh, and um, yeah, we can get back to everyone. But thanks for your time, and um, yeah, then for for making time this afternoon. We all thanks, everyone. Cheers. Cheers.